guys, it's your favorite reliability test guy here with another fun-filled, action-packed video on reliability tests and validation topics. This current video is an introduction to MIL standard h 3 Overview and application on contamination by fluid and solar radiation. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you do, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and let's get started. In this video, we'll cover contamination by fluid overview, test equipment, test and application, and failure modes to look out for, and solar radiation test and overview, test equipment, and test and application, and failure modes to look out for. Let's go ahead and start off with an overview of method 504.3, contamination by fluid. Contamination by fluid is an important test to consider for your system, as a probability of chemicals splash and sprain or getting brushed or rubbed onto your system are very likely to occur. Everything from systems carried by troops, systems mounted onto Humvees, parts mounted on the aircraft, and even parts and systems getting assembled at a supplier have a potential risk of getting exposed to some type of chemical contaminant. This could be anything ranging from a cup of coffee spilling on hardware to overspray from spray paint to even gasoline or even jet fuel splashing onto a piece of hardware part or system. Please keep in mind that this testing is intended for accidental but probable occurrences of chemical contamination. It is not intended for systems that are intentionally and continuously submersed in some type of chemical or fluid. Let's jump into test equipment used for contamination by fluid. The test equipment is not extensive for this test, compared to all of the other tests that we will cover in MIL standard A10H. Mainly, the items required are PPE, support supplies, and the chemicals themselves that will be used for the testing event. Let's start off with PPE. Some of the chemicals we will be covering in the test and application discussion shortly in Table 504.3 are some really nasty stuff. You should read through the SDS or safety data sheet for all chemicals you will be using for your testing and determine appropriate personal protection equipment that will be needed. As a guideline and recommendation, you should either have or procure chemical gloves, face shields, and even chemical suits and respirators depending on the types of chemicals you are using for your testing and the size of the space and ventilation situation of the location you are testing in. There are a few ways that chemicals may be applied, and again, this is up to your system's particular application and your mission profile. But some of the equipment you may need are spray bottles, chemical immersion tanks, or brushes to apply the chemicals to your system. You may also need an oven or a temperature chamber to heat up certain chemicals based on your use case or application to represent the temperature of the chemical during an accidental but potential chemical contamination event in the field. All right, let's jump into test and application for contamination by fluid. Pictured is Table 504.3-1, which covers common chemical contamination hazards that your system may get exposed to. This is not an all-inclusive list, and there may be additional chemicals that are not on this list that your system may be subjected to based on your system's mission profile. On the other hand, you may not need to test your system to every single chemical on the list and need to be smart and do your homework on which chemicals are applicable for determining a potential exposure hazard to your system. For Table 504.3-1, there are three columns. The first column covers each chemical that is provided in the MIL standard H&H guidelines. The second column covers the source document or reference document based off of military and commercial standards for the chemical in each row. The third column provides the guidelines for what types of systems and applications have a risk of getting exposed to each of the chemical types on the list. MIL standard 18H states as a guideline to have the fluid and system that is being tested saturated to the temperatures that it would see in the field. This doesn't mean the laboratory ambient temperature conditions. This means the ambient conditions that you would see in the field. Therefore, you should look at your mission profile and determine the actual ambient temperatures that the system will be sitting in when it is exposed to chemical contaminants. The fluid contamination event could happen while the system is in sub-zero weather or freezing weather conditions, or it could happen while the system is sitting in direct sunlight in a desert where the temperature could be over 50 degrees C. You may also look at going to temperatures above the system's mission profile for a qualification test or a worst case mission profile study. You also need to think about how you will test each chemical. Will you use a separate system or material coupon for each test? Or will you test each chemical on the same system or coupon in the succession sequence? 
If you will be reusing the same part, take care as to ensure you have a method and approach that will allow you to discern which chemicals cause degradation of your materials of your system. If you are going to clean the system between each chemical test, make sure you use a chemical that will not cause further damage or prevent learning when determining your system material susceptibility to chemicals that it will be exposed to in its environment. The procedure for method 504.3 is broken up into three types of exposures. The first is the occasional exposure. This is for a system that isn't expected to get exposed often, if at all, to any chemicals during its operational field life, but needs to be tested for some level of margin of resistance or compatibility to the chemicals for that one-off instance when someone accidentally spills a cup of coffee, gasoline, solvent, or accidentally drops the system into some kind of chemical container, or whatever else causes the chemical exposure event. Or occasionally, chemical exposure is an expected event as a result of routine maintenance or cleaning of the system. However, this may fall into the next category, intermittent exposure. Intermittent exposure is where it is expected for a system to get more frequently exposed to chemicals, such as from routine maintenance, as just mentioned, or little jet fuel spilling over a system while filling an aircraft. Extended contamination is where the system gets exposed to chemicals very frequently or for longer periods of time due to the operating usage conditions of the system. Millstandard A10H provides the following guidelines for selecting your test and duration based off of each of the exposure types we just defined. With occasional exposure, it is suggested that the item is exposed to a chemical for 5 to 10 minutes. If the ambient temperature is anything but the standard ambient temperature, which Millstandard A10H defines as the temperature of 25 degrees C plus or minus 10 degrees C, relative humidity of 20 to 80 percent, then the temperature of the system or test coupon under the test should have the temperature maintained and simulated to the chemical or field environment temperature for at least eight hours. You will see standard ambient called out quite a lot in mill standard A10H. It could be used for certain steps or the middle of a test or during testing, but standard ambient is used heavily when discussing ambient conditions for performing pre and post testing. For intermittent chemical exposures or fluid contaminants, it is suggested that the system is subjected to a continuous exposure to the test chemical for eight hours and then left to air dry for 16 hours, followed by a one hour soak at standard ambient conditions. For extended contamination, the suggestion from mill standard A10H is to expose the system to a chemical continuously for at least 24 hours. If the test ambient temperature differs from the standard ambient temperature, it is recommended to maintain the temperature for eight hours and then bring the item to standard ambient temperature. As always, these are just durations are a guideline. You need to determine the chemical exposure duration, test temperatures, and chemicals that meet your system's particular application. If you are using temperature chamber to heat or cool the system, it will be subjected to, to fluid chemical contamination. The suggested ramp rate is 3 degrees C per minute or 5 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. Let's cover the framework for the procedure for contamination by fluid. As I mentioned in the last video, you need to have a pre and post test or check in order to ensure that the testing event did not cause any degradation or hard failures of your system. You will then need to execute your test based on your system's field ambient temperature conditions, chemical application method, and exposure type durations. Don't forget to wear PPE and make sure you are working in a well ventilated area. Also make sure there are not other folks working in the vicinity of your test without PPE to ensure that others do not get exposed to potentially harmful contaminants. Let's cover contamination by fluid failure modes now. The first to potentially cause failure modes is major degradation or damage to a system's materials. Chemicals can cause materials to crack, shatter, loose sealing, warp, melt, and so forth if the material exposed is not compatible with or has a reaction to foreign chemical contaminants it is exposed to in the field. Also, look out for chemical incompatibilities with coatings of materials. For instance, you may have a coating on a metal substrate to prevent corrosion, but a chemical incompatible with the surface coating can cause it to crack, flake off, or even melt off. 
Another failure mode type is causing electronics to fail or lose conductivity as a result of chemical corrosion and fluids that cause chemical or physical changes to electronics components causing undesired, intermittent, or hard failures. Let's hop over to an overview of 505.7 for solar radiation. Solar radiation is a simulation of direct sunlight exposure on a system or a piece of hardware. A good way to think about the difference between high temperature and solar radiation is the following examples. High temperature can be visualized as a system sitting inside of an unconditioned building in the middle of a desert. The air surrounding the system is at a high temperature, let's say 50 degrees Celsius. The sun may be producing the heat, however the system is inside of a shelter and is not directly exposed to sunlight and is getting indirectly heated by the sun via the heat transfer and insulation properties of the shelter holding the system. This type of heating is causing a uniform heating of the entire system by the ambient temperatures of the interior of the shelter as the system is soaking in the ambient temperature of the shelter. Solar radiation on the other hand causes directional heating and thermal gradients. The surfaces of the system directly get exposed to sunlight will be the warmest regions of the system and the amount of heat absorbed depends on the reflective and solar absorptive properties of the material on the system. Another component of solar radiation is ultraviolet radiation, which can produce actinic effects. What are actinic effects? Actinic effects are chemical reactions that occur when materials or fluids interact with ultraviolet radiation. Ultraviolet radiation can wreak havoc on materials and seals, so consider ultraviolet radiation based on your system's mission profile and also consider this when designing your system and selecting materials. Let's discuss test equipment used for solar radiation testing now. Pictured is an example of a solar radiation test chamber. Solar radiation chambers consist of special type of lamps or bulbs that produce the full sunlight spectrum, including ultraviolet A and B at various spectral powers or radiance levels, expressed using the unit of measurement watts per meter squared. Pictured is a really cool photo from McKinley Climatic Lab at Elgin Air Force Base in Florida. It is a demonstration of a large scale solar radiation test with massive heat lamps with an HH-60W Jolly Green 2 as the test specimen for this full vehicle level test. Let's cover application of solar radiation testing now. There are two procedures for method 506.7 on solar radiation. Let's cover a quick overview of these two procedures and then cover them in more detail shortly. The first procedure is the cyclical testing. This testing focuses more on the solar heating aspect rather than the actinic effects. Solar radiation testing performed based on procedure one can be done fairly cheaply using heat lamps. However, you should look at running the test with full spectrum lamps if you are concerned with actinic effects on your system. The second procedure covers steady state solar radiation testing and focuses heavily on the actinic effects of solar radiation. This is where you subject the system to light and heat from full spectrum bulbs to simulate long term exposure to direct sunlight. This is a severe test from an ultraviolet standpoint and is an accelerated test that can simulate years of solar radiation exposure within a couple of weeks to a couple of months depending on your mission profile and the acceleration factor you apply to the test. You will also need to consider if you will be using humidity for your test. Humidity combined with solar radiation can drive out additional potential failure modes. Let's discuss test levels now for solar radiation testing. Pictured is figure 505.7-1. Procedure 1, cycling test for solar radiation. This is a diurnal or 24 hour cycle that simulates systems or hardware that are left out in the open in hot weather climates to simulate the directional heating of the sun, which produces thermal gradients across the system as a result of the non-uniform heating of the system. Also notice how the spectral power plot defined as W rises to a peak at 1200 hours and tapers down as the sun moves across the sky and eventually sets to simulate the peak rise and fall of the sun in the sky. There are two separate categories for temperature levels in the diurnal cycle profile. The first is A1, which has a temperature level peak of 49 degrees C. The A1 category is suggested for worldwide deployment. The intent is to capture worst case conditions on a global scale. This simulates the most severe temperature and solar radiation events during the hottest months during the year and represents 1% of the hours of the hottest month out of the day out of any given year. 
The A1 category simulates regions such as hot, dry deserts of North Africa, Southwest and South Central Asia, Central and Western Australia, Northwestern Mexico, and the Southwestern United States. Notice for the A1 category and the A2 category that the peak spectral power and the max temperature do not occur during the same time of the day as seen graphically. Why is there a delay in peak temperature and the maximum solar radiation or peak spectral power? The Earth is a system too, and it takes time for natural and man-made elements on the planet in any given region to heat up as materials, fluids, and so forth begin to absorb heat. This is nature's example of thermal inertia. Category A2 has a peak temperature of 43 degrees Celsius and again simulates solar radiation heating in dry climates. Regions suggested for this category cover regions such as southerly parts of Europe, most of Australia continent, South Central Asia, Northern Eastern Africa, coastal regions of North Africa, southern parts of the US, and most of Mexico. Method 505.7 for solar radiation has its own specific test tolerance table and definitions for each test parameter. Pictured is table 505.7-2, which covers test tolerances and definitions for each test and parameter. For instance, total spectral irradiance is defined as the sum of energy for all spectral bandwidths at a target irradiance level on the test profile, aka diurnal curve or constant irradian. It has a test tolerance range of plus or minus 4% or 15 plus or minus watt meters per squared. Let's go ahead and jump into procedure one now. For procedure one, it is suggested to run the test for 24 hour cycles of controlled simulated solar radiation and temperatures based on either A1 or A2 categories under figure 505.7-1. But again, you may need to tailor the test levels per your specific use case and mission profile. For the number of cycles, it is suggested to run three cycles. However, if you are unable to reach the max temperature per your test profile with a temperature tolerance of plus or minus two degrees C or plus or minus 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit during the three cycles, it is recommended to perform the test for seven cycles. You will need to consider the airspeed via fan to generate simulated air and wind cooling effects. The recommended airspeed is 1.5 to 3.0 meters per second or 300 to 600 feet per minute. If you are simulating an environment with minimal wind it is suggested that you use an airspeed of 0.25 meters per second squared or 50 feet per minute. You need to take care however not to cause unrealistic overheating events by setting the airspeed too low. You also need to consider if you will be using humidity for the test. Recall that added humidity can create very different results or potentially different failure modes, especially for materials that have a sensitivity to humidity stresses. Whether you use humidity or not will depend on, again on your mission profile. Let's jump into procedure two now. A cool tidbit of information is that procedure two has an acceleration factor approximately 2.5 as far as the total energy received by the test item is concerned or in other words one 24-hour cycle as shown previously in figure 505.7-2 produces an acceleration factor of 2.5 times the solar experienced in one 24-hour diurnal cycle plus four hour period with the spectral lamps turned off to simulate the thermal cycling and stresses that would occur after the sun has set and your system starts to cool down. What does this mean? It means that one cycle would simulate two and a half days of natural exposure in the system's operating environment. Four 24-hour cycles would simulate 10 days. 10 cycles would simulate 25 days and so forth. Mill standard A10H cautions not to increase the spectral power any higher than what is recommended as the levels in an attempt to accelerate the test further. The reason for this is that the failure modes or results produced have diminishing returns and you will end up with unrealistic results or failure modes for the materials or your system that you are testing. The temperatures suggested for the test again are derived from either categories A1 or categories A2. The suggested airspeed for procedure two needs to be adjusted to maintain the realistic thermal response of the system under test. This you can find by either running a characterization test using procedure one, or even better, you can do a field experiment and collect temperature data from your system at the location the system will be operated in or the worst case possible site that you're able to travel to to perform the field test measurements. 
To prevent unrealistic heat generation, or as the mill standard h and h calls it, re-radiation, it is recommended that the volume size of the chamber be a minimum of 10 times the volume size of the system you are testing. Think back to the heat up of the Earth that has a delay between the peak solar radiation and the air temperature as a result of the materials of the Earth first heating up and saturating in the absorbed heat, and some materials also radiate the heat which causes the temperature to rise. Same thing here, except at unrealistic amplified levels of temperature, you also need to consider the dimensions of the solar lamp bank and the size of your system. It is recommended that the solar lamp bank be no more than half the dimension size of the system you are testing. You also need to think about test surfaces or mounting strategy for how your system will be configured when exposed to solar radiation in the field. Will it be mounted to a larger system and elevated off the ground? Will it be sitting on concrete? Will it be sitting in sand? The surface or mountain of the system needs to be considered in order to simulate sunlight bouncing off the sand or concrete and also heat radiation from the sand or concrete, which will be a more extreme case than just having the system elevated off the ground. Again, you will need to consider whether or not humidity is required for the test based on your mission profile. Pictured is Table 505.7-1, which provides the spectral power distribution to look for when selecting your spectral lamps for the solar radiation simulation. This simulated test level simulates at sea level solar radiation exposure. So if you are trying to run a solar radiation test to simulate a higher elevation and determine the spectral distribution for your test case based on your mission profile. As we discussed earlier, the recommended cycle for the Procedure 2 radiation test is 24 hours with 20 hours of constant solar radiation, followed by 4 hours of darkness in order to simulate the cool down and contraction of the system after the sun sets. As stated earlier, cycles could range from 10 to 50, but the cycles could be more or less based on your mission profile and the acceleration factor you are applying to the test. The operational test in a mill standard A10H suggests performing an operational test the last four hours of the 20 hour heat cycle. Again, tailor the test to your mission profile. A four hour test may be too much or not enough based on your specific use case. One final note, and a good way to lead into failure modes for solar radiation is that you need to define the acceptance criteria for the test and degradation of your system and materials. Degradation due to actinic effects that will be noted only as an observation and not considered a test failure. For instance, a material faded or bleaching may not be considered a failure on a particular system, while it could be a test failure on another system dependent on the use case and application. For instance, a material fading or bleaching may not be considered a failure on a particular system, while it could be a test failure on another type of system dependent on the use case and application, like a camouflage system that bleaches and gives away the location of soldiers on the ground by an observant enemy. Solar radiation failure modes to look out for include mechanical parts, especially parts that move and actuate either season up or becoming loose. This can occur as a result of the non-uniform changes in temperature or result in thermal gradients as different parts of the system heat up faster than other parts, causing some parts to expand more quickly than other parts as a result of the directional heating of the sun. Another failure mode is on solder joint and adhesives, which can also become weak or break as a result of the non-uniform thermal exposure. Changes in strength and elasticity of materials as they change temperature at different rates. Fading and cracking of materials as a result of the actinic effects of ultraviolet light. This is where materials react or break down quickly when frequently exposed to ultraviolet light. The failure modes described for solar radiation and previously for contamination by fluid are just a small list of potential failure modes that can occur. As I've stated in other videos, you need to create a DEFEMA to ensure that you are capturing the potential failure modes for your particular system. And that's it folks! Some key takeaways from this video are, consider the chemical and fluids that your system could potentially be exposed to. You should add chemicals to your environmental test plan that have been identified as a potential exposure hazard, even if they aren't in the chemical list within mill standard A10H. As once again, the mill standard is a guideline and it's not the procedure that you can just copy and paste and go run arbitrarily without taking into consideration the tests and application and your field mission profile for your particular system. The two types of tests we covered in procedures one and two have different intent, with procedure one being more of a heat loading and analysis of temperature gradient effects from your system, and procedure two being a test that looks for acidic effects that may occur with your system's exposure to direct sunlight. Both tests can be accelerated to reduce test time 
or to simulate a longer span of mission time or field time. But you need to be careful not to accelerate the test to a point where the test results are unrepresentative to what your system would endure in field operation. Thank you for watching this video. If you need help developing a, an environmental test plan for mill standard H or planning, setting up, or performing solar radiation or contamination by fluid tests, feel free to reach out to me at the link above or in the description links. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to my channel, and ring that bell. Thanks for watching and have a super day!